Hi, everyone. This is Digital Locations. I'm here with Tom Straub, my friend who is the president of the Satellite Industry Association. And uh, Tom, you've been there for a number of years. Can you give us a little background on you? Uh, how long have you been with SIA and what you did before that? I've been with SIA about nine years, Rich. And um, uh, prior to that, I'd had the good fortune of running an association that represents the wireless industry, um, uh, what was originally called Telecator, and then the Personal Communications Industry Association, which has evolved to WIA, which many of uh, your, your listeners may be familiar with. And then I got into business. I was involved in a variety of startup companies, most of them having something to do with Spectrum. Um, and uh, there was overlap with the, the satellite industry. And uh, a few years ago, I had thought about what I'd really enjoyed over the course of my career and running an association was at the top of the list. And I saw my predecessor had left to join the industry and just started calling some folks that I knew in the industry. And that's how I ended up where I am. So, Gotcha. So, you know, there's there's a buzzing sound going on over my head. And I, I hope, think it's 30,000 or 40,000 or 20,000 satellites roaming around up there. Um, so it's, it seems like it's a very active time for you in the business and, and your association. So can you tell me sort of from your perspective what's happening? And, and you know, we've all read about, you know, um, the um, big issues, the Elon Musks and the Jeff Bezos and, and those kind of folks. But can you give us sort of an overview from where you sit on what's going on in the satellite business? Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of growth in the industry. And in some ways, it reminds me of the early days of the wireless industry. Lots of me new too. entrants, uh, disruptive technology. And a lot of it has been driven by a decline in cost of manufacturing and launch. And one of the things that set the satellite industry apart from you know, most other uh, telecommunications infra and infrastructure industries is the need to be able to, to catch a ride into space, so to speak. So, um, but the significant decrease in cost and increase in the availability of launch, as well as the ability to manufacture satellites for a much lower cost than previously has helped drive a lot of that, um, that innovation. So um, there's really innovation across all different sectors of the industry. And I talked about you know, manufacturing launch satellites are so much smaller today for those that are deployed in, in uh, non-geostationary uh, orbits. Um, the capacity that people are able to put onto uh, uh, any individual satellite is much, much greater than in the past. Just think of the same thing that's happened within um, the wireless industry or, or uh, the computing industry. Same thing is true in the, the, um, uh, the ground segment. And so we've got the ability to utilize flat screen antennas, which uh, uh, greatly creates opportunities in you know, the the airline industry, the maritime industry, the, the ability to deploy a satellite for or a, an earth station for broadband services um, um, very easily has helped to, to, to grow that sector of the industry. And then one of the areas of greatest interest now is uh, direct to mobile connectivity from satellites. So, um, again, innovation across all sectors of the industry, helping to drive a lot of the growth. Um, one of the other things that I'll just mention in terms of trends in the industry is that we're seeing consolidation. A lot of the longtime players in the industry are, are consolidating. Again, another similarity to the wireless industry from years ago. Uh, a lot of the original players ended up consolidating, and we just saw the close of the Viasat Inmarsat merger. So right. that also was a trend in the industry worth noting. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I remember a phone call. Um, and I was, as you may know, I was at the beginning at the dawn of cellular in the industry. And I remember a phone call where somebody was pushing back, a company was pushing back from buying a bunch of cell phones for their employees because, oh, satellite's going to take over. Well, you know, maybe it took 35 or 40 years for that to kind of come around, but I think we're getting to that point now. So um, I think it's interesting from what you say that we're seeing, you know, a lot of new technologies and a lot of new things happening, obviously, with the ability to launch more satellites, the bigger payloads in there. Um, you know, these satellites are smaller and more efficient. Um, you mentioned something about um, direct mobile, uh, excuse me, direct satellite to mobile uh, communications. I was running, I ran into a dear friend of ours, I won't mention his name here, an analyst in the industry. Um, and we were having a quick chat and I asked him about that situation. 
And he mentioned that, you know, what we're seeing in the news seemed more like a science project to him at the moment, but that certainly that was, you know, a holy grail sort of situation in the industry. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think that, you know, the business model to be determined. And uh, at the same time, I would note that probably five years or so ago, people questioned whether you could even make it work technically. That's been proven. And you know, virtually every satellite operator has uh, announced plans or expressed interest in deploying some type of direct to mobile connectivity. And most of the most of the terrestrial mobile um, players seem to be partnering with uh, with satellite companies already. So um, I, I think that the, the first applications, of course, have been for emergency alerting. Um, I think that we'll see text uh, uh, direct to, 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 to mobile texting um, taking off before we see the um, uh, the voice services. But there are companies that are moving forward with the deployment of satellites to be able to, to provide um, uh, voice services as well. So I understand uh, the, the questions, you know, how do you make money? Um, but I think that in some ways, this is a great partnership. And you know, I've raised this with counterparts that I know from the, the wireless industry that we really should be cooperating on some of the issues because in the wireless industry, there's always a question as to, are you going to provide those services to, you know, pick, pick your rural uh, state senator, rural senator or, or representative you know, policymakers always want to know, are you going to bring 5G services to uh, areas of the country that are hard to serve with terrestrial services, terrestrial systems, and satellite is a natural complement to that. So um, I, I think that we still have to figure out, is there money to be made for all of the different players who have announced plans? But I don't consider that to be any different than what we saw in the early days of the wireless industry. The, right. You know, could the industry really support five to seven different companies providing essentially the same kind of service? You know, it sorts itself out. But ultimately, I think this is a great, uh, a great complementary service. And going back to one of the points that you made, I don't see satellite companies um, um, taking business away from from wireless companies at all. There's just an, a, an efficiency that you can get from being able to provide um, small cell service um, trustfully but the opportunity to be able to provide service throughout the, the country or the globe where there is no economic means of being able to otherwise provide that service, I think is where the opportunity is for the satellite carriers. Right. And certainly it's more cost efficient to do that than running fiber and then putting up a, a you know broadcast station to carry some rural traffic um, in, in a very rural place or, you know, in Africa and many, many places around the world where there isn't uh, an easy path to putting up a tower, running fiber to it, et cetera. So, uh, you know, it seems like a much more uh, logically efficient, cost-effective way to do that. It is, absolutely. And I think that, you know, those are the key points, just the ubiquitous coverage of the satellite industry and the cost efficiency relative to being able to, to deploy um, um, fiber or any other kind of terrestrial system. Right. So how did the uh, sessions you did at the ConnectX show go. Um, I, I saw, I think you had a very good turnout for that. Um, I went by the rooms at that point. I didn't get a chance to duck my head in and, and listen in, but um, it seemed like it was a very active session, set of sessions that you did. Um, what was the standpoint? What, what, what would happen from your standpoint? How was it? I thought it was great um, because it at the, at the beginning, we asked a moderator of my session, um, uh, which was the kickoff session, asked how many of you are familiar with the satellite industry? And you know, no more than half of the hands went up with respect to any knowledge of any aspect of the industry. And so I think that there was a great deal of curiosity. Um, a lot of people have questions about the points that we're, we're talking about. Now, what does this mean for my business? And of course, you know, many of the people who were there are in the infrastructure business. And is this going to be competitive? Is this going to be an opportunity for me? So I really thought that it was an edu a great educational opportunity. And, you know, for us to hear some of the questions that uh, that they had, you know, they want to know about capacity, pricing, those kinds of things, the, the, the logical questions that you would expect. But also just what is the technology? What is the difference between geo and non-geo? Just kind of some of the basics of the industry. So I thought it was a great session, a great series of, of sessions. And uh, yeah, it, there was there, there was a wonderful turnout. Uh, and again, I think it was a great opportunity for people to learn about the industry and the opportunities. Yeah, it seems like there's 
an enormous amount of money to be made in this end of the business at some point in time. Um, I think that will, you know, exactly how to do that will sort itself out. But it seems like um, this is a very um, active space and some very wealthy and smart people are active in it now. So I, I think, you know, from the standpoint of having been an, a wireless guy steeped in that business and now seeing this, maybe this is more the natural uh, selection or the natural um, evolution of that business. Do you see it the same way? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because there are certainly some billionaires who are investing in the industry. And and this is an industry that you know, traditionally has required a significant amount of investment and a longer time horizon than many investors uh, feel comfortable with. Um, but we've seen a significant amount of, of investment in the industry. And I think that it was in uh, 20... It was in 2017 that there's a report that was prepared uh, um, by Bryce Tech, which is an organization that uh, prepares our state of the satellite industry report about early stage investment. And they noted that that year there had been more investment than the previous year, early stage investment in the satellite industry than in the previous 15 years combined. Mm -hmm. And that has continued to grow other than um, what are the COVID years when there was a step back. So I think that, um, you know, it's not just the billionaires who were investing in the industry. Venture capitalists are realizing that given some of the trends that we've talked about, um, there's an ability to be able to launch a satellite or a satellite constellation and start generating revenue much more quickly than in the past. So um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of investment coming in. Uh, the billionaires get a lot of the attention um, and with good reason, they're doing some amazing things, um, but it's not just uh, a, a few individuals who are are providing the investment uh, uh, for the growth of the industry. Yeah, it's funny because in the back in the uh, cellular days, we had a bunch of broke guys that got RSA licenses and ran to Motorola and said, build this for me. Now you've got people with real money, you've got billionaires investing in the satellite business. So it seems like the the methodology or the mentality is flipped, um, you know, start with a big pile of money and, you know, maybe you wind up with an even bigger pile as opposed to, you know, when you had a couple of dollars, but you got a free license from the FCC and now go figure out how to do that. So the consolidation in the wireless space, the terrestrial wireless space was a natural here. I wonder if you're going to see that kind of consolidation in the future in, in satellite. I know about the, uh, the Viasat, Inmarsat deal closing. Uh, but do you see consolidation happening in satellite industry the way it did in wireless? It, it It's similar. Let me put it that way, because um, I think we're still seeing some of the deals announced and others to be announced. And let me let me clarify that, because, you know, I'd mentioned the Viasat, Inmarsat. Uh, those are two traditionally geostationary satellite operators. Um, but UTELSAT has also announced its plans to acquire OneWeb. Um, so that's a traditionally geostationary satellite company that is acquiring a, a, a LEO company. SES, traditional uh, um, geostationary company, acquired O3B, which has a, a, a MEO system, a non-geostationary system. And so I think that for many of the traditional players, they're identifying you know, what is the opportunity with non-geostationary satellite systems? And so some of them are investing and some of them are acquiring. So um, we're, there are different types of, of acquisitions that are taking place. Um, so I'd say that's why I say similar to what, what happened in the in the wireless industry, um, because here we've got, you know, I'll say traditional players, mostly geostationary companies. Um, I don't know whether we'll necessarily see some of the, the LEO players uh, merge in some, in, in most instances, they're deploying different types of technology, and that's been one of the challenges for the satellite industry. Is that most of the players have deployed proprietary systems. You know, the 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 wireless industry relatively quickly got to uh, a couple set of standards and then a common standard. You know, we're not we're not quite there yet, and I think that five G will help drive some of that because um, satellite is included in the five G standards. So we've got companies that are deploying. Uh, to the 5G standards, that may help drive some of the non-geostationary uh, uh, M&A activity. So yeah, um, it's it's a it's a trend that started. I expect it to continue over the next few years. How the companies match up still to be determined. Do you see us living more in a Leo world in the future, though? Um, that's where the the action is 
at this particular time, seems to me. And so do you think we'll all be living in a LEO world in the future? Well, we'll definitely see a lot of LEO stationary satellites that are operational and continue to be deployed. But um, it's not like geostationary satellites are going away by any means. The number of geostationary satellites continues to increase and the capacity of them uh, is increasing as well. Viasat and, and uh, Echostar are examples of two companies that traditionally have provided broadband, direct to, or direct to consumer broadband services. Viasat just launched their Viasat 3 satellite and Echostar will be launching their next generation satellite fairly quickly. Um, so I think that we're going to see um, combined offerings. You know, each of those companies is looking at how they can best be able to, uh, to provide services that, you know, those that uh, you know, have a need for high capacity, um, like a, an airline, especially as they're coming into um, um, a hub. You know, it's not just when you're flying across the ocean or across the country. Right. You need to be able to continue to provide that coverage uh, as you're approaching an airport. And that's an area where there's a need for uh, high capacity. But also there are instances where you need the lower latency that LEO systems um, um, and can offer. So I think that the answer is we're going to see uh, both geostationary and, and, and LEO systems available and the services from them. Um, and, and, you know, I, again, we'll see some companies providing both. And that's some, some of the acquisitions that I expect to see take Interesting. place. Yeah, when I think of geo, I think of a bigger, bulkier handset. And when I think of Leo, I think of the potential uh, for there someday to be the ability for that ubiquitous coverage. I don't know what I'm doing, what would necessarily, who's broadcasting to me. It could be my ground-based wireless system. It could be a satellite. It could be a... Um, a you know, some other CBRE, excuse me, CBRS technology that's talking to me, and it's the same handset I'm always accustomed to. So I think that's a, a big part of the Leo world, if you will. It, but it, it, it is, and, and because you're that much closer to the um, um, the surface of the Earth, you don't have the same kind of power requirements that you do from a geostationary satellite. But again, geostationary satellites have the advantage of uh, breadth of coverage. You know, it takes three to essentially cover the uh, the vast majority of the, the surface of the Earth. So you know, different applications, if you're using the distribution like uh, uh, direct, to TV, direct to to consumer television services or uh, satellite radio services, there's definitely an advantage to the, the, the wider coverage. Yeah. Well, uh, we've been talking with Tom Straub, the president of the Satellite Industry Association. Tom, it's been a thrill to catch up with you and talk again. And I hope we get to see each other soon at one of the events. I look forward to it. Me too. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate the time today. Sure.